Hey, welcome back to Scanner School. This is session number 189, Ask Scanner School, volume 35. In this podcast session, I answer your questions. And again, this fits what Scanner School is all about, right? We teach you everything to know about the Scanner Radio Hobby. So I accept questions via several formats, all can be found over at scannerschool.com slash ask. But the trick is, if you submit your voicemail, you are in the running for a free tutoring session. So after the intro here, I'll give you all the details on how you can win a free tutoring session. I will answer some questions and we'll pick a winner at the end of this podcast episode. So let's go ahead and go through all the intro stuff and we will be right back. Today's podcast is sponsored by our two brand new training courses. Our free SDR course, the Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Software Fine Radio will get you started with SDRs in an afternoon. We will show you what hardware and accessories to buy to get started with Software Fine Radio. Then we'll show you the step-by-step how-to to install the drivers, tune your first frequency with SDR Sharp, and then have you monitoring digital at the end of this free course. Our advanced course continues with beginner's course left off and levels up your SDR experience. In this course, you'll learn even more about software-defined radio. We will show you how you can substitute an SDR for your high-end digital scanner, how to monitor HD radio, monitor trunk systems and overhead data with Unitrunker, and even how to monitor all the talk groups on a system and never miss a beat with SDR trunk. You can sign up for both courses at courses.scannerschool.com. Before we start this week's podcast, I'd like to take a moment to thank our Patreon supporters. Patreon is a month-to-month sponsorship platform. We have three different support tiers, each with different benefits. But the most valuable tier is our $5 a month tier. This equates to sponsoring the podcast for about a dollar per episode. Now, not only do our $5 Patreon supporters receive the podcast early, but they also receive a commercial-free version of the podcast delivered directly to their podcast player. Some may say that the included squelchy sticker pack that is mailed to your home is the best benefit of the $5 level, but I think it's the community or the club that is growing at this level. You see, we meet once a month on Zoom, and we have a roundtable discussion about scanning, ask questions, offer advice. Some of the members are answering other people's questions, and we just talk with our fellow scanner school classmates. This is an exclusive group for our $5 Patreon members. Now, again, if all this wasn't enough at that level, you'll also receive discounts to upcoming Scanner School courses and offerings. Now, you can help support Scanner School by going to www.scannerschool.com slash Patreon or www.scannerschool.com slash support. Now, I'd like to thank all of our Patreon supporters at all levels, and they are Arthur Heron, Bill K, Brian King, Buzz Gold, Chris Paris, Craig Harper, Dan, Dave Pasco, David C, Danny Crotty, Ed Walsh, Edward Bramblett, Evan Barcock, Glenn Wright, Greg Johnson, Guy Lee, Jack Haycock, Jack Barry, James Broxson, James Felling, James Peruta, Jeff Block, Jeff Chapman, Jenny Taylor, Jim B, Jim Heinrich, John Keel, John Swinney, John Goldenberg, Ken Newberry, Kenneth Fowler, Kevin Zwicky, Lenny Bauer, Les Stevenson, Lynn Smith, Mark Beebe, Mason Kramer, Michael Kroger, Nicholas Stenger, Paul Teal, Raymond Hill, Robert, Robert Kanzler, Robert Kanzler again, Ronnie Box, Sal Marandola, Signals Everywhere, Terry Weatherford, Tim Mazza, TJ, Todd Glendie, and William R. Cand. Now let's start the podcast. Welcome to The Scanner School, a podcast dedicated to the scanner radio hobby. Class is about to begin. Here is your host, Phil Lichtenberger. Welcome to Scanner School's podcast is here to teach you everything to know about the scanner radio hobby. My name is Phil Lichtenberger and my amateur radio call sign is W2LIE. Now, again, today I'm answering your scanner radio questions, and many of you have submitted questions via our Ask page over at scannerschool.com slash ask. Some of you have emailed me your questions and by responding to a couple of emails that I have sent out. So again, we queue those up as well. And also, we're going now through our Twitter and also through some of the questions we are receiving on other social media platforms, including YouTube. And we are pulling out some questions from there as well. And, of course, answering them here on the podcast. Hopefully being able to then tag the people who are asking the questions so they know to listen to this podcast episode. But if you use our speak pipe or our local number, which is 516-308-2885, 
to ask me a question. We put you in the running for a free tutoring session. Now, these are sessions that are normally, uh, I believe, about $47 for a full hour, sometimes more of scanner radio questions and answers, right? So you can contact me. We sit down, go over Zoom, and have a video session set up where I can see you. You can see me. Again, you don't have to put your uh, your uh, camera on if you don't want to. It just helps, you know, bring the face-to-face there. But again, we can do some screen sharing and some link sharing and, and some file sharing and stuff like that to help you through whatever it is that you are struggling with when it comes to the scanner radio hobby. And again, it's one-on-one me and you sharing screens and getting through whatever is holding you back from, you know, enjoying things a little bit more. But again, I do give away those sessions again once a month by picking a winner. And again, you've got to go to ask uh, scanschool.com slash ask, use the speak pipe link, or again, our local number 516-308-2885 in order to qualify for that. So with that, we have two questions that came in from our voicemail methods. We'll get to those first. Oh yeah, by the way, those questions get moved to the top of our Q&A list. So again, if you want a question answered right away, that's also an incentive to get you to call in. All right. So let's go ahead. First question comes in from Jeff. Jeff, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Phil. Uh, This is Jeff. I have a question uh, regarding simulcast interference. Basically, how do you know that uh, the in an interference that you're getting is simulcast interference? I have a P25 network that I monitor with three dongles, and every once in a while I get uh, signals which appear to be basically wiped out. They're they're active, as in you can see them on the recorder, but they're just recording garbage, so like, like in the form of squeaks and squawks. And I'm just trying to figure out, is that, in fact, simulcast interference? So if it is, how do I fix it? And and, and I understand directional antennas and lower antennas and that sort of thing. But how do I, how do I, maybe the the real question is, how do I diagnose it at a technical level by, say, looking at the spectrum on the radios and analyzing where the signals are coming from or some sort of, interference pattern that might occur in the spectrum on one of the radios or the other. Say, for example, the control channel gets wiped out or something when this occurs. If you could help me figure that out, I'd appreciate it. And I'll talk to you later. Hey, Jeff, that is a really interesting question there. So let's break this down into several different pieces here. First of all, how do you know if the interference you are getting is from simulcast? Well, you've pretty much identified that on your own. Criteria is a digital form of modulation, such as P25. You normally don't get this kind of simulcasting issue in an analog environment, right? Because what happens is your scanner needs to put zeros and ones back together in certain frames, right? In certain parts of the packet because it's completely digital. And for anybody who doesn't know, there's a lot of stuff that happens digitally to a signal Besides just the audio, there's a whole preamble and there's a whole stop bit and the CRCs, which is basically checksums and error corrections. They all go out as part of this data packet and wrapped up inside of this data packet are the bits for the voice traffic, right? It's the same way your cell phone works, basically, or even a voice over IP call, right? You've, you've got a whole bunch of stuff going on in the middle of this container. In fact, even how the internet works, you've got a whole stack that happens inside the stack, such as you have the TCP IP, and then inside of there, you've got the HTTP and, and you know, all this other stuff, that nonsense that happens. It's not just a simple, I'm transmitting, you're listening to me anymore, right? That's the analog days. The digital days is a whole bunch of stuff that happens that's got to get sent to the radio, decoded properly, and then put back together and the... And the um, not only does the talk group information have to get pulled out of it, but also the audio information needs to be pulled out, sent through the digital to analog converters in your radio and then out your speaker or through, in your case, the software to find radio is handling, or the software rather is handling all of that conversion for you. But again, it's got to get from the RF environment through your SDR and into your computer in order for things to be put back together again. 
So first part of the question, how do we know we have an issue with simulcast? It's got to be digital. That is the first part right there. Okay, the next part of this. Every once in a while, you're getting signals that are being wiped out, right? Forms of squeaks and squawks. So if you weren't listening on an SDR, let's go back to a handheld environment here. What would happen most of the time is you would see that if you're watching the scanner, you'll see that the radio is going to try to go to the voice channel. And it's going to quickly come back to the, to the control, uh, control channel here. So you might see the talk group ID show up really quick and then goes right back to control channel, right back to scan. Maybe you'll hear a pop or you'll hear the beginning part of a transmission. But generally, that's what happens. Go to the voice channel. I can't decode what's going on here. Let me go back to the control channel. Sometimes you'll notice that you are missing a lot of the transmission. Maybe you'll hear the beginning part of it. Maybe you'll hear a return uh, unit come back to the dispatcher, right? You're just not getting full parts of conversations. That's another indication that you are having problems with your, your simulcast. But how do you know and how do you fix it when it comes to SDRs and even your handheld scanners and your mobile scanners, right? It kind of falls in the same path here. And again, we're going to talk about this on a future podcast episode. I actually had this in, in queue to talk about. We'll break it down here really quickly. But you don't necessarily need an outdoor scanner or uh, antenna or the best antenna in the market or even an outdoor antenna. A lot of these digital networks are built for 90-something percent reliability and usage from a handheld device to get back into a network. Think about this. Most of these systems have police on them. A lot of cops get out of their vehicles and are using just their portable unit. If they got a call for help, they're going to need to get on the network. So most of the area now has really good blanket coverage. It's not like the old days where you had one or two repeaters and a lot of voters. Now things are very well saturated in, a, in, an, in an area that they're trying to cover. Okay, Again, frequencies are changing. They're going from UHF up to 700, 800. You, you already need more transmitters just to do that. But in order to meet whatever criteria they have, usually it's like 95, 97, 98% reliability on a network. They got. They really got to build it out. So with that said, you are probably going to be able to get away with just using the antenna on the back of your scanner or an antenna in a window or not even anything outdoors, right? Especially if you listen to a local trunk system, just bring in just enough signal to get what you have to get done. You don't need to bring in everything anymore. Those days are over when it comes to P25 trunking. Now, if you're listening to a county away or a city away or you're trying to DX or something like that, yes, old school rules still apply here. Outdoor antenna, get gain, low loss coax, the whole deal. But again, if I just want to listen to my local local trunk system, the bare minimum is really good enough to get what you have to get done. Don't overdo it when it comes to antennas. We have to learn to think differently now that we have P25, simulcast, and digital. All right, technically, how do we know how we fix this, how we diagnose this? Well, there's things we can look at on our computers, especially when it comes to software-defined radios, and it's called the magic eye. Okay, the magic eye will show us basically what our, our signal is, but also we've got the ability to, to look at the quadrants, I hope I'm saying that right, the four corners basically of a signal. Minus one, minus, uh, was it minus one comma minus one, minus one comma zero, or minus one comma plus one, right? Whatever it is. It's it's basically the, the upper left, the upper right, the lower left, the lower right. And what you want to do is, is when you're looking at this on the graph is you want to have really uh, it's, it's a constellation. That's what it's called. It's the constellation uh, display. And you want to make sure that the constellations in each quadrant of the, uh, of the, of the signal is grouped tightly or is grouped as tight as possible. That means that everything is coming in and is being heard really well and decoded by the scanner. If you have anon anomalies, anomalies, boy, I really am having a hard time with this one today. If you're having issues with bits all over the spectrum in that part of the quad, right? Then you know you don't have a really good decode. You're having issues with simulcast, right? You want to have really tight groupings. Imagine you're at the firing range and you're trying to group into the corner there and you get that one oddball one that goes out. All right, you're going to dismiss that. But if you can't get a, a tight grouping on there, right? 
you know you've got to improve something, right? Well, same holds true when it comes to scanner radios. Again, I don't know why lately with the scanning hobby, I'm really referring to a lot of those kinds of analogies here when it comes to that. But I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, and I'll try to avoid that maybe in the future. But that's the best way I can say it, right, is, is if you know you've got a problem with having too much too many bits outside of, of the constellation, then you know you've got to improve and you're going to have really a bad time when it comes to simulcast. So technically, that's what you can look at. When it comes to your hardware, don't overdo uh, the processing of your radio or your computer. Just bring in just the amount of, right amount of RF. Don't overdrive your SDR sticks. Bring the gain back on them if you, if you do have them on an outdoor antenna. Right? These are all things that you can do to help improve your simulcast reception when it comes to scanning. Now, again, why are you getting just forms of squeaks and squawks? Because, again, it doesn't know how to put the zeros and ones back together in the right place again. It's trying its best to do something. But when things are just out of sync, sometimes it's hard to bring them right back in again. So, Jeff, all good uh, questions here. Glad to hear you back on the podcast as well. Thank you for asking a question. And best of luck at the end of this podcast, winning a free tutoring session. So, with that one, Jeff, thanks again. And we have another question in. From Nick. Nick, go ahead. Go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Phil. This is Nick Stinger in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you I love what you're doing. It's nice to have a group of scanner enthusiasts together. I've been uh, into scanners for, man, probably about 20 years now, and I turn 32 next week, so that ought to put it into perspective for you. But, hey. I think you mentioned one time, or at least once, that you're also a ham operator. I'm looking for a handheld or mobile ham radio that can also do scanning. I understand probably won't find anything that can do digital, but uh, just analog scanning. The only problem I have is... Uh, in Hagerstown, Maryland, our analog dispatch frequency is 33.86, so that's pretty low in the spectrum, I think. And a lot of the handhelds that I see that have any kind of receive don't go that low, other than the Yesu VX6R, I think it's called. Hey, thank you, and hope to make the podcast, and 73s to you. All right, Nick. Very good. So you want to do some scanning with an amateur radio, but you threw in a little bit of a curveball there. You want to get into low band, about 30 megahertz or so. I think you said 28 megahertz. So here's the problem. Most scanners or most amateur radios will let you do scanning. Okay, It's just a matter of where you can do it. So a majority of them do have extended receive. So say you bought a two meter radio, which covers or allows you to transmit from here in the States about 144 up into uh, the top end of 147. They will receive only up to like say 164, right? Maybe they'll receive only down to 108. So you can get the aviation band in there. Some of them know you get lucky and you can receive down even further, but you're looking at that point to looking for a, dual band radio right the more money you spend sometimes the more features you get so if you're looking for a dual bander then of course now you're gonna get a radio that does two meters and 440 for anybody that doesn't speak uh that again it's about 140 144 to 140 top end of 147 and then from about 438 up into uh the top end of 449 again you'll be able to receive then from about 435 or maybe 4 about 400 maybe, all the way up into sometimes 470, 480, maybe 512, really depending on the radio. I got some radios here that you think that they're UHF and they stop at 470. They don't even cover into the T-band. So you got to watch what what you're actually looking at and buying. But again, you're throwing me a curveball here when it comes to 33.86. So when it comes to scanning, though, before we even get there, yeah, I'm teasing you along here, but before you get into it, let's understand how scanning typically works when it comes to a amateur radio. Amateur radios have banks in them. Typically, you can throw in sometimes 10 channels in a, in a bank, 20 channels, 100 channels, whatever it is. Sometimes you can just randomly define uh, frequencies you program into to banks. That's great. That's, that's getting more flexible with you right there. 
But sometimes you can't turn on multiple banks. You can only turn on one bank at a time, or you can take a bank and daisy chain them, such as my old Kenwood uh, TM V71A. Basically, I can take two banks and and bring them together. So instead of I only have 100 channels to scan, I can have 200 channels to scan. But again, I have to turn that bank off or on and then another bank off or on, right? So they're not really scanners, right? They're still two-way radios. They're clunky when it comes to scanning, but it's still you know better than nothing. And of course, in New York, I'm kind of limited to having a amateur radio in my vehicle and scanning with that because part of the vehicle traffic law is any scanner or any radio you have that travels outside the amateur radio band must be a transceiver, not a receiver, right? So there's a big difference when it comes to that as well. So getting back to what you're talking about there, you did trip on something. The Yesu VX6R is a current radio by Yesu that will go down into uh, low band. It will even go down even further into medium wave. So that's a radio to look at. In fact, personally, I don't have a VX6, but I do have a VX7. And uh, that one does go down. In fact, I also have a VX3R, and that one also goes down to, I think, 1.8 mega or just something like that. So those older discontinued radios, a great radios to own. I have both, like I said, a VX6R never made it into my pile, but they are still current radios from Yesu, the VX6R. So go for that. Uh, if you have something extra money to spend, uh, the FT3DR, that's, that's their digital touchscreen radio, that will also go down into medium wave. So that's another radio you can look at. That will get you 33.86 in a scan list. Uh, some of these you can't do in the primary scan list. you got to do it in the secondary side of the radio because sometimes when you have dual band, you've got a primary and a secondary. And the secondaries usually have a, a bit wider receive than that as well. On the Kenwood side, though, you've got a THD74A. That's Kenwood's top-of-the-line handheld radio. That one is, is also digital. I believe that one does D-Star. Finally got another radio with size icon that does D-Star. And uh, I really didn't look at any of the manufacturers after FOIA, such as Alinko or Icom, uh, Baofeng. I guess we want to group them in as well, but... Um, I stopped at Yesu and Kenwood, giving you a couple options when it comes to that. But again, small scan list. Be prepared to be a little bit uh, aggravated when it comes to the way you set these things up. I've, I've never really had too much luck scanning when it comes to a ham radio, but it is possible. The scan rates aren't going to be as fast as a dedicated scanner. Lockout features, uh, resume features kind of are, are limiting, but again, it's... They, they expect you to kind of want to stop and listen when it comes to a hammer, amateur radio stuff. So it's a bit different. It's a different world, right? It's it's um, They're not scanners, right? They're two-way radios that have the ability to scan through channels. And, of course, they've always had that, even, even back uh, as soon as they went into uh, the old days. So good luck. Let us know what you get. I think anything you buy that will cover down into 33.86 is going to be a fantastic radio. I think you'll be very happy with whatever it is you purchase. It just matters, though, on how deep your pockets are. Again, I think the ASU VX6R might be your, your easiest entry point into it. Again, if you're looking for something used, the ASU VX7R. The 3R is really hard to find, though you can find them. They're really tiny uh, micro HTs. They're fun. They don't put a lot of power. They'll fit in your pocket. But um, best of luck. Let us know how you make out. And, uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, my call again, W2LIE. And maybe we'll talk on the air one of these days. Maybe if you got a uh, general class license, you can on HF. Or uh, if uh, you come in through any one of the digital modes, I've got radios here that will do D-Star, DMR, and also Yesu Fusion uh, C4FM. Although I haven't played around with surprising Surprisingly, with P25 or NXDN radios, just hasn't been something I've I found myself playing around with too much. But again, best of luck. Let us know what you settle on. Let us know if you pick anything up. And thank you so much for asking your question. Again, don't forget to stick around to the end of the podcast to find out. It's just up against you with Jeff on who's going to win the tutoring session. Okay, on the other side of this break, though, we are going to come uh, through two questions that came in that were non-voice questions. One actually came in from email. One came in from Twitter. As a reminder, anybody who is a Patreon supporter at the 3 or the $5 level uh, gets to skip this break. So if you want to skip these breaks besides pressing the fast forward button on your podcast player or on the YouTube videos, you just go ahead and go to scannerschool.com slash support or scannerschool.com slash Patreon and uh, upgrade to a Patreon 3 or $5 level. And of course, not only do you get the podcast earlier than everybody else, but you also get it break free. 
Okay, we'll be right back after these words. Did you know there are ways to help support the Scanner School podcast that doesn't take any time or any extra money on your part? If you go to scannerschool.com support, you will find we have several ways that you can continue to do your online shopping and help support us. We have links to Amazon. If you click on our link before you go to Amazon, anything you buy from there, will help support Scanner School. Now, if you're in a market for a brand new scanner, an antenna, other accessories, we have links to Scanner Master, where you can not only purchase a scanner and accessories, but you can also get your radio programmed. And by clicking on our link before you buy, you are helping to support the podcast. Now, if you're in a market for software, we have links to Butel. And if you want something new to you, we also have links to to eBay. Again, just go to scannerschool.com slash support before you make your purchases and you are helping to support Scanner School at no additional cost to you. This session of Scanner School is sponsored by East Coast Pagers. Now, East Coast Pagers is one of my online companies, and we are a Unication, Apollo, and Swiss phone dealer serving the North American market. Now, if you're looking for a personal use pager or one for your department, we can get you a quote at the very best prices. So why does a company like East Coast Pagers support Scanner School? I think that every Scanner Radio user should at least put one pager in their collection of radios. The reason why is very simple. It frees up your scanner to just do scanning, and then you have one radio that's dedicated to your local fire activity. Now, with a pager, you can have voice storage. You can do tone outs. You can keep it silent. You can go back the next day and listen to what you've missed overnight. It's more than you can do with an out-of-the-box scanner. And with today's pagers having multiple frequencies and even having multiple channels in a scan list, like the Unication G1 can do eight channels in a scan list. It has 64 memory channels, and out of the box, it comes with 11 minutes of stored voice and a desktop charger. The G2s to G5s, they do P25 phase one and phase two in simulcast environments with stored voice, paging on conventional NP25. Oh, and they're upgradable too to DMR type one and type two. They are more rugged than today's consumer based scanners. And with a pager like a Swiss phone S quad, you won't even realize you're wearing one. It'll help keep you informed as to what's going on in your neighborhood. So again, eastcoastpagers.com or contact me directly phil at eastcoastpagers.com do you have a new scanner you're having problems understanding how it works maybe you're new to the entire home patrol database of programming and you can't figure out sentinel did you get a new sdr and you're trying to figure out how to install it or you want to learn how to use unitrunker dsd plus maybe set up a pioware or even just make some changes and you don't understand how the system and the equipment works the podcast might be great for you, but maybe you need a little bit more of one-on-one help with setting something up. I'm available to do just that with you with our private tutoring sessions. You can book me online by going to scannerschool.com slash consulting for a one-hour session. And it's great because we can actually share computer screens remotely, and I can guide you through step-by-step as if I was sitting right next to you. So again, book me for an hour at scannerschool.com slash consulting for your scanner radio one-on-one tutoring session. National Communications Magazine is your personal library of scanner, CB, GMRS, FRS, MURS, and two-way radio articles written by the best minds in the business over the past three decades. Your Natcom personal online access account allows you to download the newest issues of America's Hobby Radio Magazine, as well as back issues too. So visit natcommag.com. Dot com to download your free sample issues and sign up today. That's natcommag.com for National Communications Magazine. Okay, this question comes in from Twitter user Danny Good. Danny is saying, is there any software for Uniden for Mac or is this something that will never happen? So there is no software put out by Uniden that will support any Uniden scanner on your Mac. Now, I am a Mac user. I am a very heavy Apple user, surprisingly. Phil from 10 years ago would would be rolling his eyes right now if he understood just how involved I am in the Mac ecosystem. For many years, I protested getting into a Mac. Eventually, podcasting led me into uh, using my iPod Touch a little bit more than I was used to. And then I got tired of carrying around an iPod Touch and a cell phone, so I migrated over to a cell phone. 
that was made by Apple. I bought a, an old iPhone 5S just to see if I can live in that interface, which then I bought the XR when it came out, or the 10, 10R or 10S, whatever it was, 10S maybe. And then, uh, yeah, the rest is history. I ended up buying the, the desktop when I started. Actually, I bought the desktop when I started podcasting because I knew I'd need a better computer, which then led to the iPad, which then led to the, 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 the laptop, which led to the watch, the AirPods, the whole deal. I love the ecosystem. But it stinks when if you want to enjoy the scanner radio hobby, there is like nothing available when it comes to scanning and your Mac environment, which is a real bummer because – just the way that things look on a Mac, I think I just enjoy it more. But you got to keep that Windows beast around. Or you've got to do it. You do have options, though. And the first one is there's a piece of software that's available on the App Store, which is mislabeled. It's actually called Scanner Remote, and it's been labeled as Saner Remote. I'm missing the C in there. I don't know if it's been corrected as of this time. But it's a remote control software that does run. It's built for a Mac that will remote control a radio such as like a BCD 436, 536, SDS 100. I haven't played around with it at all. It's free as far as I know. Uh, the, the author is is teasing the idea of making it a 99 cent application. But um, that's something to take a look at. But what you can do and what I have actually done is if you install Parallels on your Mac, I know that people use Boot Camp, but you use that to run Windows. And once you've got Windows up and running on your Mac, then you can run any type of Windows software on there. So I have actually run Sentinel and Butel software on my Mac using Windows. I never really had much luck running Parallels. It always seemed like it was it was um, running very sluggish and very slow. Other people have no problems running Parallels. I don't know what my problem ever was with it. I gave up. I basically, I just I just bought a four hundred dollar laptop before I bought and built my couple thousand dollar desktop I got set up behind me. But uh, but yeah, you, you kind of have to live in a windows world when it comes to the scanner radio hobby unfortunately when it comes to any kind of radio i guess it's it's all windows and that's where the most amount of users are and that's where these uh, manufacturers cater to now mac is also transitioning all of their hardware from the intel chip over to their m1 chip and i don't know if anything that used to run on the intel chip will now run on their new mac chips so Maybe Windows will still run. Maybe it won't. I've never really looked, investigated to look it up. My my two Macs that I have here are still older generations. I haven't upgraded yet into that new architecture that was recently put out by Apple. So long story short here, unfortunately, nothing natively works in a Mac environment. You can try the parallels of the boot camp, see if that works out well for you. If you can get Windows to run in there, then you should be able to have... Uh, have your software running there without any problems. If you're running the SDR world, uh, there are SDR pieces of software, just so you're aware of, uh, that will run fine on a Mac, SDR++, uh, SDR Glut. Those are two flavors of software that work on your Mac when it comes to controlling a software to find radio. So with that, best of luck with everything when it comes to using your Mac. Again, your mileage is going to vary on this one. And I, my recommendation really, to be honest with you, is um, bow down to uh, to uh, the Windows gods. Get yourself a cheap computer and uh, go ahead and throw Windows on there or, or have it with come with Windows and just use it for your programming. I mean, it's it's going to save you a ton of, a ton of problems, a ton of headaches. It'll save you a couple of, uh, you know... <sighs> heartburn nights and stuff like that as well so that's my advice unfortunately it is what it is but uh hey you're a good company i feel your pain really great question and again we will tag you on twitter so that you're aware that this uh question was answered over there uh on this podcast episode if you have any questions feel free to reach out to me would definitely love to uh to answer some more of your questions okay so our final question of the month before we pick a winner for our free tutoring session comes from joe and joe says i've got a bearcat bc 355 n scanner i live in a senior housing and i have mag mountain tennis by my patio doors and he lives in the town of Osgood in Ripley County. Can I put a small antenna amp to help with the weak signals? Okay, so here's what you can do basically to help yourself out before you go into the whole thing of doing an antenna amp. I, I really dislike preamps on the antennas. I think there's other ways that you can help yourself out before you get to there. 
So the first thing I would say is make sure you've got that mag mount antenna on something that is magnetic, cake pan, air conditioner, top of the refrigerator, something that is magnetic. You're going to need that magnetic base because your mag mount antenna is looking for the second half of the antenna. The reflected antenna, the RF, right, the electromagnetic reflection comes from that magnetic base. You need to have it on something that is magnetic or you need to have radials on the bottom of the antenna. Some antennas do have a radial kit. It's just easier to have a cake pan, right? Just something small, 8-inch cake pan, something sheet cake pan, something like that. It's got metal on it. Will help out. Okay, what if you've already got it on a cake pan or something that's metallic and something that's metal? I would look at an amateur radio antenna that's cut for the frequency band that you're looking for. If you're looking for VHF, UHF, you really didn't specify, but I'm going to assume it's one of those being that you have a BC355N. You're not really looking at trunking because that scanner doesn't support it, so we're going to rule out 800 megahertz right there. Go and look at some amateur radio antennas. Go to hamradio.com, go to Gigaparts, DX Engineering, any one of those, and take a look at what they have to offer. I would recommend Diamond Antennas or Comet Antennas. I've used all of those. They have gain in them, which means that they will suck in more than just your standard telescoping antenna or your really tiny antenna. That also reminds me too, you want to have an antenna that is cut to the frequencies you want to use. If you're using an 800 megahertz antenna and you're trying to receive low band, you're going to have a really hard time trying to do that with the wrong type of antenna. So an antenna that is cut and tuned for the frequency ranges you're looking for will certainly help out. Antennas will come in different sizes based on the amount of gain right, and the frequencies they are cut for. You can also go to diamondantenna.net. That's another good resource to look and, and see what the specifications are on antennas. I don't have any one I would recommend to you. It's all going to be how much space you have and what frequencies you are looking to go to go with. But again, a antenna like that that is magnetic may may help out. Now again, too, some of those antennas do not require a ground plane, so they can also not be tied to something metallic. But again, you may find out too that if you do ground the antenna, say you run it to a copper pipe or to something that is uh, grounded in your home, maybe you will actually improve reception as well by doing that. Another thing you could try and do too is trying to put a disc cone antenna in an attic space and run that down because again, now you're gaining some height off of the antenna. That's another thing to do. If you can get the antenna outdoors even by a little bit, that might help you out because again, an antenna outside is much better than an antenna inside. So those are different things I would strongly recommend doing besides putting in a preamp in there. If you really have to go with a preamp, yes, you can do it. People have done it. I've done it. I haven't really seen much of an improvement on it. Sometimes you can just raise your noise floor and then you end up raising the um, the level going into your scanner by too much and it's just too much noise and your scanner can't uh, can't handle it. I've, I've had it happen to actually do a BCT-8. Uh, all my scanners in the array worked fine except the BCT-8. I actually had to throw an attenuator in there and keep the signal from coming in as hot as it was. And to be honest with you, I kind of fear the same thing would happen to you and the BC355N being the, the type of receiver that it is, that it's not a uh, a high end, let's put it that way. I don't, not, not to be insulting because, uh, you know, it, it's just not a, a couple hundred dollars scanner, let's put it that way. It, it is relatively low on the... Um, price point so i don't know how well it would re how well it would perform if you ended up throwing a preamp in there but again you know this is a hobby right which means that we are constantly tweaking and changing and, and going through different kinds of things to see what it does to to this to what we have set up right and and that's what makes a hobby fun right is playing around with things and, and changing it up and tweaking and, and, and experimenting right so there's no harm in trying a preamp to see if it works for you you may find out hey it works great you know and you may find out uh, i'm not really ex getting what i'm expecting out of this so again would i do a preamp no I'd, i would i would go through the antenna route first and once you've gone through there and picked an antenna out and if you still find out it's not working well then try and, and look at a preamp. But again, make sure your, your coax too, that the ends are solid and nothing is pinched. Uh, the ends didn't come off. And again, there's no harm in using RG6. In the home, LMR 400 is just not, it's just not going to look right indoors, basically. So if you can hide it with, with RG6 cable, I see nothing wrong with that. And again, you can find plenty of RG6 pre-made with BNC connectors on both ends, being that it's, it's widely used in the CCTV industry. So again, try the antenna first. Make sure you definitely have a ground plane on it. When all else fails, 
then you can go preamp. Really great question, Joe. Thank you so much for asking it. And again, we do got other podcast episodes earlier in the catalog that does go through uh, preamps as well. Okay, so with that, we do have all of our questions answered for this month. And again, I want to remind you, go to scannerschool.com slash ask and submit your questions. So let's pick a winner. We have two in the bucket this week. We've got Jeff and we've got Nick. So what I do have for me right now is a spreadsheet with two names on it and numbers one and number two right next to it. And I've got a cell right next to it with a random number that will pick between one and two. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hit refresh five, kind of five times. This way it has a chance to cycle through the numbers. And when I stop press and refresh on the fifth time, whatever number shows up is the number of the person who will be winning. So Jeff, you, since you were first, you get number one. And Nick, since you were two, obviously the second one, you get number two. Okay, let's go ahead here and start pressing the refresh button. I got one, two, three, four, and five. Nick, congratulations. You are the winner in this month's free tutoring session. Please reach out to me. Email me at phil at scannerschool.com. And we will get you set up with a code that you can use to redeem your free tutoring session. Now, again, if anybody else out there has a unused tutoring session, let me know because the, uh, the coupons I send you never expire. You can bank them. But if you have misplaced that email, again, don't feel bad. Just reach out to me. And I want to honor the uh, the free tutoring session that you guys have earned. Okay, so with that, I want to thank everybody who has asked a question on the podcast this week. And again, I remind you that we are live tonight. Again, we're going to do it early than we have been doing it. So it'll be 8 o'clock Eastern time. I think last month it worked out really well. So we're going to stick with that again for another month. So again, catch us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for our free Q&A session tonight. Tuesday, the first Tuesday of the month is when we always have it. So again... The only way I can really help more people to scan a hobby is if you help me help more people. So if you know of anybody that would benefit from listening to this podcast, please make sure you share it with them. And also make sure you subscribe to the podcast on any podcast player and also on our YouTube channel. So you're aware of when we drop new podcast sessions and when we go live for our Q&A session. So again, as a friendly reminder, you can ask me your question, scanschool.com slash ask. You can also send them via SpeakPipe or our local number, which is 516-308-2885. And we will catch you for another podcast episode next week. Again, my name is Phil Lichtenberger, and this is Scanner School. We teach you everything you know about the scanner radio hobby. 73, everyone.